So there was a time not too long ago when we were unable to see patients early. We were unable to diagnose them accurately and we were unable to treat them effectively. And exactly how we achieved a complete rethink for a disease that was previously regarded as untreatable is actually a, a remarkable project. So rheumatoid arthritis remains incurable, but also highly treatable. Uh, it's a symmetrical inflammatory arthritis that persists for years with no tendency for spontaneous remission, which sets it apart from many other types of arthritis. We can measure the inflammatory process by tracking blood tests for substances such as C-reactive protein and measuring the ESR. And these measures reflect the overproduction of inflammatory cytokines that's occurring in the joints and systemically. The autoimmunity in rheumatoid arthritis is reflected in the elevated levels of rheumatoid factor and highly specific antibodies to altered proteins, which are called anti-CCP antibodies. These are proteins to citrullinated proteins in the body uh, that occur for various reasons and are highly specific markers of the disease. These antibodies don't cause the disease, but probably amplify the inflammatory response to cause damage. And they're associated with chronic pain, functional and work disability, loss of quality of life. And it also causes accelerated coronary artery disease and increased mortality uh, if it's untreated. Past obstacles that we had to contend with were false perceptions that nothing could be done, that rheumatoid was not life-threatening, unlike certain other diseases. We lacked the tools. We really didn't know what was the correct thing to measure. We now know that measuring swollen joint counts and tender joint counts and combining these measures with appropriate blood tests, such as the C-reactive protein, and getting what we call composite measures of disease activity is highly useful. And we've realized from insights uh, with better and more sensitive imaging, how effective it can be to track patients with sensitive ultrasound and MRI imaging in selected cases. Cortisone was a useful drug that caused side effects and we couldn't manage these side effects because we didn't have the treatments for osteoporosis and we didn't know the right dose of cortisone to use. We had no reliable treatments to stop joint damage like we do now. Treatments such as methotrexate, the TNF inhibitors and small molecule targeted therapies that we'll talk about. So one of the other obstacles is that once rheumatoid arthritis has momentum, it's very hard to stop. Damage occurs within months and is relentless. Um, the disease actually becomes biologically more complicated the longer it lasts. It becomes a different disease with each passing year. Um, this also makes it a lot harder to treat. Damage occurs fast and within months of first symptoms. And here's an MRI from a patient showing the bone erosions, the structural damage time when the patient had a swollen wrist and a tender wrist, had difficulty using the hands, uh, but the plain x-rays at this stage showed swelling, but were unable to show damage, creating perhaps a false perception that not much was happening. If we look at patients uh, as the arthritis progresses, we see periarticular bone loss around inflamed joints. The, the joints that are typically inflamed in rheumatoid are these at the uh, metacarpophalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints. We also see cartilage loss that reflects loss of cartilage, uh, the joint space narrowing here, and the characteristic bone erosions in persistently inflamed joints. And these are the hallmark feature of severe seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. And in general, in general, patients with erosions, when we see them, are more difficult to treat. They can achieve a low disease activity, but less often they can achieve remission. So early and aggressive treatment is needed to prevent this damage. Now, before the 1980s, rheumatoid arthritis was treated with aspirin, anti-inflammatory tablets like indomethacin, gold injections, or penicillamine. And sometimes these treatments worked, but usually they made patients sick and patients couldn't take them for very long. We had weaker drugs like hydroxychloroquine 
And of course, we had cortisone injections. Um, but this was really the era of despair. While Wall Street misbehaved, something remarkable though was happening in rheumatology. Methotrexate emerged as the first treatment that really made a big difference to patients. And methotrexate was a treatment that was developed for leukemia in the 1950s and was rediscovered and redeployed for rheumatoid arthritis. And we call drugs like methotrexate disease modifying drugs because they can actually uh, modify the outcome of rheumatoid arthritis and they can sometimes prevent damage. So here's one of the first studies from Boston that showed improvement in arthritis within three months of methotrexate therapy. And you can see here the joint severity index that they used at the time. Patients on given methotrexate within several months had a remarkably reduced joint in pain index and inflammation index compared to those that got the placebo drug. And then in three months, the groups crossed over and the methotrexate patients got the placebo and they promptly reverted back to their baseline. And the patients on placebo were given methotrexate and they improved. And in some patients, these erosions that were seen, if they maintained methotrexate therapy for a long enough time, they could actually heal. And it was one of the first times, although this was seen with gold uh, on occasion, very rarely, it was one of the first times that we could consistently see good disease suppression enough so that the joint could heal. So this was remarkable um, for a chronic disease. Methotrexate um, was easy to take, it was taken once weekly, it was well tolerated. Uh, we learned how to use folic acid to make it better tolerated and patients can take it for a long time. If you have a, a disease that lasts for many years, if you can take a treatment for a long time, it can make a big difference. Now, one of the problems is that if you treat methotrexate, and there are a number of studies, and this is perhaps the purest of them from the Netherlands, we can show that it makes a huge difference when you start. So this is comparing patients who started methotrexate within two weeks of onset of arthritis compared to those where the ship sailed a bit later at four months. And you can see this is the change in bone erosion over two years, but the patients that were treated early maintain minimal levels of joint damage compared to those that started just a few months later. So it's like, you know, you, you miss the window of opportunity if you delay treatment. And this was a very important insight. And studies like this led to the concept of this window of opportunity early in the disease when it was perhaps biologically more simple and easier to treat and really was a very important step in the treatment. So as good as methotrexate was in the clinic, we still had a problem. Patients would come in with swollen hands and joint stiffness and pain, they had disability. We'd treat them with methotrexate and within a year, they'd look something like this with less joint pain, less swelling and improved function. And we think we're doing okay, but then as we follow them, typically they'd see someone different in each, in each time in the clinic. Uh, something like this occurs when the head of rheumatology comes along and finds this, having remembered the patient like this seven years earlier. So there was a problem. What's going on here? So the, the insight really was gained with better imaging. With better imaging, it was soon clear that the reason was that DMARDs such as methotrexate can produce a clinical remission but they rarely produce a deep imaging remission. Therefore, DMARDs such as methotrexate, our conventional DMARDs, rarely produce what we consider to be a true remission. And this explains the progression of damage that we see very often in patients who appear to be in a clinical remission. And this was an unmet need at the time. So how was this unmet need addressed? Well, if we delve into the biology of the joint, and now this is like Fantastic Voyage, where right inside the joint, here's the bone, the cartilage, and the inflammatory panis. I um, mean, immunologists uh, identified a myriad of cells that were relevant, including antigen presenting cells and T cells. They worked out how these cells were activated, how they interacted with B cells and plasma cells, and the macrophages here. There are a number of soluble mediators that we call cytokines that can serve as communication. Uh, agents between these cells. This cell is very important because it pumps out molecules, cytokines such as TNF and IL-1 and IL-6. 
uh, and is responsible for orchestrating much of the damage along with others. And it was very hard to pick a winner out of all this. And it was really through elegant science and uh, trial and error and animal studies um, that the way forward was seen. And in fact, early on, um, TNF was a cytokine that seemed a likely suspect because it was made by activated ac macrophages, which were very plentiful in the joint, which stimulated other cytokines such as IL-6 and IL-1. It released prostaglandins from other cells, which are to do with pain and inflammation. And it's the molecules that uh, aspirin and anti-inflammatories can block. It affected bone cells and cartilage cells to promote joint destruction. So it looked pretty suspect and uh, was a good target to, to go for. And this uh, heralded the era of biologics, which we term targeted therapies. Now biologics are gigantic molecules, typically they're monoclonal antibodies, and they're called biologics because you can't make them in a laboratory, no matter how clever you are, no matter how much tools you have, what reagents you have, if you don't have cell culture, you can't make antibodies. Um, so this is why we call them biologics. And over the years, we've developed biologics that neutralize TNF-alpha and neutralize other targets, such as IL-6, and affect B cell function and T cells. Um, just to, um, to, for you to know, these are big, big things. And if it's like you know, a small molecule like Celebrex is like a teacup in your hand, and your house or a bigger building is this molecule, and the business end is right here where it binds specifically to its target and it neutralizes it. So if you inject this substance, you can neutralize and um, you know, overproduction of this substance and therefore do some good things in arthritis. We have um, newer drugs, which are small molecules, which are also called targeted therapies, but they're not biologics because if we give the correct reagents to a clever chemist, they can make these small molecules in the laboratory. And these include the JAK kinase inhibitors of which we have several now that we're using in the clinic. So this was a remarkable achievement as seen here. These are patients from the Kennedy Institute that were treated with infliximab that blocks TNF. These are patients here with methotrexate therapy and they're not doing well, they're not responding. If you treat them with infliximab, you see substantial responses here in blue and even better responses if you add uh, infliximab to methotrexate. So this was kind of a revelation and the revelation was confirmed by the um, sensitive imaging that was being developed at the same time showing that with a TNF inhibitor. So from this baseline, this is the joint swelling here, the residual joint swelling, um, you could actually achieve something like this to, to uh, uh, minimize joint swelling and prevent joint destruction. Now, we know from our studies that um, the harder we knock down inflammation, the better the results in terms of preserving the joints. And you, this is shown here in a study that looked at patients. This is the disease activity score, um, higher disease activity, higher damage, less disease activity, less damage over time, this is with methotrexate. If you add a TNF inhibitor to methotrexate, you can improve this remarkably and uniformly prevent joint damage irrespective of any uh, residual inflammation. Now, of course, these patients would much prefer to, to be like this because if they have inflammation, they typically will have symptoms and pain. So although biologics do um, uniformly stop damage, what we want is a treatment that can improve symptoms, quality of life, and stop the damage. And to a large extent, these treatments do that, but there are some exceptions. Now, in rheumatology, we talk about ACR responses. And what, what does this mean? This is the American College of Rheumatology. Well, it sort of refers to the degree of, of, of suppression of arthritis. So if you have a 20% reduction, you have what's called an ACR20. Now, an ACR20 needs a rheumatologist to detect a difference. An ACR50, where there's a 50% improvement, a medical student can pick that level of improvement in the clinic when they visit us. An ACR70, your neighbor knows 
that something's different about you, that you're moving better and that you're feeling better and other people can notice a difference. So with methotrexate in early arthritis naive to treatment, we can see about 25% achieving this very good low disease activity response. If we add TNF inhibitor, we can increase that. Um, and so um, typically what we do in practice is we start with methotrexate and if we're not able to achieve a satisfactory outcome, we add a TNF inhibitor. Now what happens, so this is what happens if you add it to people that are not responding to methotrexate, you can push uh, uh, greater numbers of people into this preferable state of being. What happens if patients don't respond to TNF? Well, they're a harder nut to crack. As we move along the right here, it becomes harder and harder to treat rheumatoid. We can use rituximab that blocks B cells. We can block IL-6. We can block other molecules uh, to do with T cell function. And if we do that, we, we can get you know, some responses. But as you move from patients that have never seen methotrexate to those that prove are resistant to methotrexate and those who are resistant to TNF, it becomes harder and harder to get an ideal outcome. So the problems that we have with targeted therapies is essentially that they don't always work. So there can be what we call primary failure, that sometimes there's secondary failure when the body produces neutralizing anti-drug antibodies. And this is one of the reasons we often use it together with methotrexate to try and prevent this secondary failure phenomenon because these are proteins, they're large proteins and the body thinks there's an invader and it makes neutralizing antibodies. So that's why we use methotrexate. There are patients who can't have them because they have some you know, additional illness such as they've had a history of lymphoma or they've got severe heart failure or they've got MS and they can't have these drugs because they make those conditions worse or they're contraindicated. And by far the most serious problem is infection, manageable, but if patients are older or they've got a history of infection or they've got diabetes, this can be a problem with the TNF inhibitors and, and other targeted therapies. So the unmet need is that about 50% of the TNF therapy experienced patients who are incomplete responders on TNF therapies can't achieve this ACR70 low disease activity state, which is where they want to be to preserve their joints, to preserve their quality of life and to preserve their work capacity. About 10 to 20% of patients prove resistant to multiple biologics. So why really what we need are new ways to knock down these cytokines that fuel the, the damage to the joints that doesn't involve uh, these things and is, is a sort of a fresh thinking type of approach to the problem. It's possible that Vagal nerve stimulation may be the way forward. This is an anti-inflammatory vagal reflex that was discovered some years ago, wherein the vagus nerve, which is actually the longest nerve, the, in, one of the longest nerves in the body that connects the brain to the rest of the body, if it's stimulated appropriately, it can transmit signals to the spleen, where there are T cells, and those T cells can in turn inhibit macrophages and monocytes, re, uh, producing TNF and IL-6, and suppress a host of cytokines. And this is a very promising non-drug approach to manipulate the biology of arthritis for, for patient outcomes. So to summarize, the solutions that we come up with are to see patients early in that window of opportunity to provide access to rapid sort of clinics, to aim for uh, a treatment target that maintains function and quality of life. And this is usually low disease activity for all patients. And it can be remission for those patients that don't have severe joint damage. We hit hard early using whatever it takes. We use methotrexate in combination with biologics. If a biologic doesn't work, we switch, we, we get creative. We treat to target, we adjust the therapy if it's not working or if it causes side effects. We can in many cases de-escalate and taper treatment when patients are stable, but it turns out that we can't stop the biologic therapy because if we stop it, the arthritis returns, but we can substantially reduce it in many or most patients down to about 50% of their dose and maintain a good remission. And we have new ideas to knock down these cytokines and the new ideas, the exciting um, device 
uh, devices um, that recall Ehrlich's magic bullets are these vagal nerve stimulators. And um, Sophie's going to tell us a lot more about that. Thank you for your attention.